In addition to measuring the energy gap in superconductors using the tunneling junction and demonstrating that tunneling was occurring, Gaber also won the Nobel Prize because he observed what is now known as the Josephson effect, though he didn't know it at the time. So just a little bit of background. Um, superconductivity occurs when electrons pair up into what are called Cooper pairs. And these Cooper pairs flow with no resistance, which is what is observed as superconductivity. The reason that um, this occurs is because Cooper pairs are bosons, while each of the individual electrons are fermions. So at low enough temperatures, the Cooper pairs condense into the same quantum state, just like superfluids, um, which occur with um, atoms that are bosons, for example. The strong correlation between the Cooper pairs means that they don't have any resistive interactions, so this also contributes to the fact that they're flowing with no resistance. A big part of the Josephson junction is the relative quantum phase between the wave functions for the Cooper pairs in two superconductors on opposite sides of the tunneling barrier. So um, this is the relative quantum phase for the wave function, and all of the Cooper pairs will share the same wave function because they are in a correlated state. What Josephson showed through deriving some equations is that the tunneling current through the barrier is proportional to the sign of the relative quantum phase of the two Cooper pairs. Um, how he derived that is kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But what he also showed with the same equations is that if there is no potential difference between the two superconductors, there can still be a DC current through. And this is known as the DC Josephson current, which um, is the DC Josephson effect and is what Gaver actually observed. So these are the plots that Gaver had in his Nobel Prize lecture. And this first plot is showing the current through the tunneling barrier at different magnetic fields. At a very um, higher voltage, he noticed what looks like a short, and he noticed this in multiple experiments. I'll start with a vertical line here. But he thought that it was a short and discarded those devices. Only later did he realize that this was actually showing the DC Josephson effect, which is the tunneling supercurrent. So this is where the current is increasing while the voltage is staying constant. The reason that um, these magnetic field dependent measurements are all different um, is also due to um, experiments that Josephson and his experimental collaborators found where they showed that um, if these supercurrents were indeed occurring, they would have a very sensitive dependence on the external magnetic field. Whereas this would not happen if they were only due to shorts, because then the um, short current, or what, what they thought was a short, would occur at all magnetic fields. In fact, these magnetic field dependent effects were so sensitive that even the Earth's magnetic field was determining whether the supercurrents were occurring. So by canceling out Earth's magnetic field with an applied field, or by changing the applied field even further, um, he could get these very fine magnetic field dependent results. And at certain critical fields, the supercurrent occurred. Um, we know that if you've taken Physics 431 and done the superconductivity lab, that superconductivity depends both on the external magnetic field and the critical temperature. So by changing the magnetic field, the um, point at which superconductivity occurs will be different. One application of such Josephson junctions is in what are called superconducting quantum interference devices, or SQUIDs. And these are made out of two Josephson junctions. So um, in this illustration over here, um, both of these Josephson junctions together make up a SQUID. We found a paper where they specifically are looking at Josephson junctions that have um, ferroelectric material, ferromagnetic materials in between them. And when this happens, um, the magnetic polarization of the material determines what the relative phase between the Cooper pairs in each of the two superconductors is. And from Josephson's equations, we know that that affects the tunneling current through the device. So what they show in this paper is that by controlling the external magnetic field, they can control the ferromagnetic polarization of the material in the squids, and that causes there to be two quantized values of relative phase, either zero or pi. 
and these quantized relative phases create a quantized current, which can in turn be used to create a ferromagnetic quantum bit. Sorry, a ferromagnetic normal bit. And they can control the bit with the H field. And this means that they can create um, ferromagnetic memory devices. So for example, in classical computers, um, bits have a, either a value of 0 or 1, and how exactly you encode the bit varies. So this is just another way to encode a bit. And yeah, this is just a cool example of um, how Gaber's work directly relates to some pretty interesting applications. And thank you for listening.